Greetings, folks, and welcome to another edition of the Wisdom Keeper podcast. And I am delighted, of course, as I always am, feeling very grateful to host an amazing guest today, Freddie Silva, a best-selling author and leading researcher of ancient civilizations, restricted history, sacred structures, and their interactions with consciousness. Freddie is a leading expert in crop circles, and he leads pilgrimage to sacred sites in England, France, Egypt, Portugal, Yucatan, Peru, Bolivia, and Scotland. I am, uh, I know Freddie in relationship with Helen Tomey at Sacred Earth Journeys. We both are operating out of Sacred Earth Journeys. Helen is the main operator of our tours. And so I was very, very happy to get a, a, door, a good a good response from Freddie, welcoming him on, to, on this show. It's, it's not uh, often that you get access to this caliber of uh, expert. And so I feel really grateful and I'm sure you're going to join me in feeling that this particular conversation was a treat. Freddie is a published author of many acclaimed books, seven in total, and also a producer of documentaries. He has 13 of them. And we discuss some of his, the themes of some of his books, The Missing Lands, The Divine Blueprint, another book that I particularly like, The Lost Art of Resurrection, and also, of course, his most recent release, Scotland's Hidden Sacred Past. Freddie's website is Invisible Temple, and there you will find his books, his documentaries, and also a stunning array of his photographs. He's truly a wonderful, one-of-a-kind guest. And in this episode, we had the pleasure of sort of tracing Freddie's journey out of what we would call the ordinary world of, of advertising and into, I think, his inroad into the esoteric world was through crop circles, which he has now celebrated, I believe, a 25 year anniversary of his seminal text on crop circles. Uh, but more, more to the point, I really, really enjoyed sort of taking a big step back to welcome in Freddie's theory of an ancient pre uh, pre uh, pre ice age civilization. And he's among probably a small cadre of three, four experts in the field that are really opening up the narrow picture of the world. Most of us have a picture that we've been handed to us of a world in which sort of Neolithic prehistoric man is a, a hunter gatherer of nature and somewhere in the fertile crescent uh, along the banks of the Tiger and Euphrates River all of a sudden we are meant to believe springs forth high civilization in Sumeria and later Egypt. In other words, human beings make this quantum leap somehow to design architectural structures, monolithic structures that could scarcely be replicated today even with the most advanced advanced technology. And this has always been a curiosity of mine and people like Freddie Silva uh, and of course Graham Hancock and others, they have spent their lives really withstanding the pressures of the academic elite who, who you know, are sort of invested in keeping the mainstream story and not truly in my estimation, practicing pure science. Science is about investigation. It is about pushing every boundary, testing every hypothesis, looking for anomalies, not discarding them. Uh, if things don't add up, then there, there should be a commitment to revision. And in, 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 in basically what we have, uh, have here is this sort of the old establishment, the old guard, the Egypt, Egyptologists, the mainstream archeologists, sort of hand, standing firm on the world picture that we currently have. And then you have these other researchers that are sort of open-minded as Freddie says, interdisciplinary people who are willing to take a look at things not only within the box but outside of the box looking for patterns 
following the breadcrumb trails, and in a way enduring a lot of personal attack. This is, these are not people that get gain instant fame and fortune as a result of their uh, hero's quest. These are people that endure, and many more of them don't make it to the stature and the credibility and the uh, and the and and the performance and the output. Uh, of the Graham Hancocks and the Freddie Silva. So you have to hand it to them that something has motivated them to push through all the pushback and to endure criticism and some of it quite nasty <clears throat> and, and have basically their careers and their livelihoods threatened in order to put forth an assertion of some position that there may be another way of explaining some of the discrepancies that we're seeing in history, some of the anomalies that we're seeing in history, and to change the picture, to put forth a new picture that in fact, civilization didn't just spring up out of nowhere, seemingly with no origin story, but that in fact, there may have been another chapter in the human, in the human, uh, in the human odyssey that was lost to time and that there is an archeological evidence and act that matches with an ecological evidence to sort of conclude that possibly a meteor struck the planet, it caused great cataclysmic devastation, it sent us, thrust us into a ice age, uh, what's now called the Younger Dryas period, and on the tipping, tipping scale of that uh, period was a sea uh, melting, another probably another meteor strike that then ended up melting some of that ice melt, causing a dramatic sea rise and challenging many a civilization from which we derive <clears throat> many of the origin stories throughout culture and throughout religion all maintain of some sort of flood myth in which there is a kind of sacred holder of knowledge that survives the flood myth and i think we could easily as Western minded, closed minded, scientifically uber rational minded people dismiss it out of hand as legend. But what if you started as Graham Hancock, Freddie Silva and others have done circling, circumnavigating the planet, speaking with indigenous people, really truly listening to their myths and, and starting to see consistencies throughout that the prior civilizational people that bring forth the knowledge, the science, the technology, and the initiatory rights all have a common source. And so without going too into that, I'll let Freddie introduce his own theory to himself. I just want to say that one of the things that is so exciting is how to really open one's mind. There may be things in here that you won't want to hear it's worth it to just try to ride through the, the, the initial reaction and see if you can really meditate on what's being said and then maybe become curious. People that have created a whole volume and library of research for us to uh, avail ourselves, maybe it's time to see if we can uh, join them in keeping an open mind and exploring the possibilities of a prior civilization that has bequeathed our planet sacred initiatory rights, very profound wisdom, mind-blowing technologies, and incredibly sophisticated sciences that don't fit the linear picture of man steadily evolving from hunter-gatherers and quote-unquote primitive folk to high technology. In fact, in fact, if we look around, it is quite possible that we are on the decline and that actually prior prior generations of human history and prior civilizations had something far more sophisticated than we can even conceive of. How is it that those pyramids were built? How is it that a site like Gobekli Tepe, which is now dated at some 10,500 BC, fall, blows out of the water the current picture of the pyramids rising or the Sumerian civilization rising out of nowhere? So I also wanted to take the opportunity on the heels of the uh, just a stellar, stellar performance in this interview with Freddie Siller. I wanted to just pick one theme that really resonates with me as I continue to write my book, Return with Elixir, 
By the way, Return with Elixir, I am pleased to announce, has found its home with Inner Traditions, Bear & Co., which is the publisher. Of course, that being a publisher that Freddie himself has used in the past for a book called uh, The Resurrection and the, art of Re the Lost Art of Resurrection. And therein lie a very common uh, motif that he and I both share our interest in, our passion in. Return with the Elixir is a book about Tibetan alchemy. It fuses with Tibetan alchemy. Joseph Campbell, his monomythic lens and the, the, the mythic dimension of life. And I also include there a strand of Carl, Carl Jung and his depth psychology and his process of individuation. So I, I really pressed Freddie in this interview with a little bit more on the art of resurrection than perhaps his new book, although his new book is stunning. And one example of the just the, the mind blowing aspect is when he ventured to Scotland uh, for his new book, uh, the hidden land, the sacred hidden uh, Scotland, its sacred hidden past. I think that there is a image of a island with a cave in it and this island is some 18 miles some across and it according to freddie was in use for centuries as an initiatory island in other words initiates would work their way up through a process of arduous study contemplation and practice until they were ready for to embark on an actual rite, they would make it to the island and they would enter into the dark cave, which is the womb like urn, and make their way through an arduous journey filled with peril that likens itself to the womb of, 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 the, of the divine mother through the narrow birth canal. And they would do so in such a way that it was timed with the stars so that at the end of it, for those that made it through the initiation and through the dark night and through the peril and through the danger and through the birth canal to the other side would find there uh, on the spring equinox, a particular constellation in the sky on the other side of the island, venturing out the other end of the tunnel through a cave portal and see, and there see or meet the cosmos and its divine constellation of the divine mother and i think that this is exactly freddie's bread, bread and butter he is a man who travels to sacred sites whether they be monolithic in nature or temple sites used as rite of passage crucibles places of achieving higher consciousness could be the uh, great pyramid could be the temples of in, in, in Peru, the Mayan temples in Peru. He has been everywhere and anywhere using this particular lens and threading just a enormous corpus of knowledge, which I tip my hats off. But for this particular cave, why it was so symbolic for me is it very much resonates with what I'm trying to reveal in my book, Return with the Elixir, which is a, we are undergoing a metamorphosis on a global scale right now. And that there is an opportunity for each of us to embrace a personal metamorphosis in the meantime, so that there is both an outer and inner, a reflection of resurrection or rebirth. <clears throat> and I say that because most of us are seeing the tea leaves, most of us are seeing the writing on the wall, most of us are experiencing the signs of disillusion and yet buckling under tremendous pressures and fears, and yet, and yet, world mythologies and world astrologies and world myth uh, and world um, origin stories and prophecies are foretelling that we are actually living in a very special time of transition a great crossing over whether it be the mayan calendar or the tibetan uh, shambhala prophecy others like it this is the great crossing over between two ages from the piscean to the Aquarian age, a span in time, a window in time that can take in human terms at least 80 years. But nevertheless, we are seeing cataclysm, what what is also called a catabolic collapse. The structures are collapsing around us. And this is terrifying. The economic system is collapsing. 
The currency is being inflated. The supply chains are being disrupted. There is war and havoc as we try in a way to shore up our, renew our, our energy sources. The last little bit of oil is under pressure. The divisions are, the, you know, the powers that be are doubling down. Uh, there is great scarcity uh, because we have outgrown this model of globalization. We are at the tail end of our civilization and it is on its decline and rather than resist it and rather than go, you know, trying to find a bunker uh, where we can hide out with a bit of, uh, with a bit of tin food and some water, we should embrace it as a spiritual opportunity, welcome in the change. And of course, this is going to be rough for most of us and probably rough, even rougher still for those who have fewer resources. And definitely those of us with a Bodhisattva connection will try to do our best for everybody who's game to surrender and let go. Let, let the course of nature, let the contractions happen, let the death process unfold, knowing knowing that the angels are at the threshold to collect us knowing that consciousness this is this is this is consciousness and the evolution of things is spiral in nature there is always a dissolution to meet a, a, a dissolution and collapse to meet a expansion and renewal and this is this is death begets death begets death not actually death begets rebirth begets death begets rebirth and so this is an opportunity and so from a personal point of view, if we can also recognize the signs and symptoms of our own internal collapse, that is relationships no longer function, that is our health is breaking down, that is our mental health is becoming, we're becoming symptomatic. And rather than reach for the Advil or the, uh, the Prozac or the whiskey or the Instagram, that we actually look into the messages of the psyche to say it is time to move yonder, it's time to move beyond, it's time to let go, and to really surrender. And this is a process that takes and requires initiation. And so what I try to do in my book, Grad uh, um, Return with the Elixir, is I'm trying to cull from various cultural milieu, various uh, institutions, a kind of monolithic or universal motif. And I think Freddie is a very good inspiration for this because he's a man who's already done this for decades. So I have a lot to learn from him and I hope you enjoy it too. I try to paint a picture of the hope that we can let go when things are contracting and then enter into the initiation period or the initiation phase where we turn to ancient knowledge. And so Freddie is putting forward a long legacy of an ancient knowledge that has many names. It has many names. The Tibetans knew about it. The Indians knew about it. The Mayans knew about it. The Egyptians knew about it. The Sumerians knew about it. In a way, they share a very common motif about how to die well how to go through a metamorphic process where one's innate qualities are revealed and then to uh, recast themselves anew, to be reborn. And so it's no coincidence to me that this is the impetus of my work. I feel that the pandemic at the outset of 2020, Jan, the conjunction between Saturn and Jupiter brought forth the beginning of the end of this phase and ushered us into the temporal, the middle way or middle ground or bardo. And that's where we find ourselves right now. And this is where I think, because we're at the tail end of the demise, people really do need to learn how to go into free fall, let go, free fall, make the concession, you know, let let the ground and the carpet and the floor be pulled from underneath you and take take a deep breath and and allow yourself to to go into free fall rather than do what the instinct forces us to do which is to grasp buckle down brace hold on for dear life make bargaining make it make a make a, you know try to bargain our way through things it's really a trust fall into the arms of reality the cyclic arms of our own evolution. But then in the initiation, to call in sacred knowledges that have existed on this planet for millennia, 
that have been obscured because of the advent of science and the hyper-rational age of reason to find our way back to old systems of knowledge and to heed their advice about how to live well. And this is not to disparage science for all it has given us, it has also failed us tremendously. And it's not that we have to displace science as much as we have to integrate science with old wisdom. Wisdom and science paired in unison like a consort, like a, like a, like a deity with a consort, pairing wisdom with science, paying, pairing reason with intuition, a heaven with earth, whatever, whatever metaphor you like to use, and then allowing ourselves to use the next generation, the next 40 year span as our, part of our effort to retool. And so I see this across the planet, for example, in the economic system as it collapses because of hyperinflation. I mean, you just look at the news and you can see country by country, one by one, Venezuela, Argentina, recently Sri Lanka, maybe Nepal is next. Who knows? One by one, countries are collapsing. The United States has always felt itself to be so immune, uh, but don't think for a second at 10% inflation that the, uh, that the train has not left the station and that anything is possible. The world is incredibly fragile, uh, that there's no stopping that. And there's no, there's no, there's no guarantees that we too are, are immune to a collapse. Uh, the, the energy sector, I mean, it's a mess, the energy sector. We're looking at the last little bits of oil that we can you know, carry on with. Uh, globalization is at its apex and we're now contracting. Population is at its apex and we are now co co contracting. Uh, so read the signs and look for old world culture. How did they survive? What did they have to teach about their people, about community, about bargaining and sharing and gift economies, uh, bartering, excuse me, not bar bargaining, but bartering economies, share economy, gift economy, uh, the energy sector, how to live with less. Uh, the, the, the economic sector, how to decentralize and use a cryptocurrency, for example. Uh, and then also the archetype of the wisdom, the spiritual knowledge, whether it be the Sri uh, Karana of, of Bali or the ancient Tibetan approach or the Mayan or the shamanic, how do we live a good internal life? And so I'm starting to see that there are these pillars that are emerging in my mind. They are energy, they are food, they are economy, they are inner life, and they are community. These five pillars represent the possibility of a new world. They are five pillars that in order to go forward, we may actually have to go back, borrow, learn, put ourselves at the feet of ancient wisdom keepers, and learn how to revise and, and procure our food, learn how to use less and create renewable energy, learn how to create efficient economies, learn how to heal ourselves through natural medicine, learn how to cultivate an inner life, learn how to self-govern and be sovereign and yet egalitarian and sensitive to the needs of other communities in a kind of tribal mode. I think these represent the possibilities of a new future, a rebirth, both as a kind of microcosm and as a global civilization. And so this is my interest with return with the elixir. I'm thinking now that it's really important for me to bring in more guests like Freddie Silva and the guests that I've had on the show before and really uh, diversify the conversation so that it's not just necessarily on this, the inner life, although that's always going to be the center pillar for me, meditation, ceremony, ritual, yoga, philosophy, the inner yogas, the inner sciences, but also it would be nice to start to get some wisdom keepers to talk about the astrology and to talk about uh, governance and to talk about food production, talk about renewable energies, to talk about cryptocurrencies, because we are on our way through the death canal in a rite of passage on our way to a new civilization. Let's look back let's be respectful let's procure for them procure from them the wisdom legacy so that we can actually create a roadmap for our future so that's just a little bit of where my head is at i am amidst 
the second or third chapter of the book Return with the Elixir. It is now coming at a great time, this conversation with Freddie, because I can see what a, an epitome of knowledge, collective wisdom and uh, a knowledge he is. He's traveled the earth. He's been on pilgrimage to all these sites. He's done unbelievable things. He's really uh, sort of expanding the parameters of our vision of our past, which means we get to reevaluate who it is that we think we are and where it is that we think we're going. And so without a doubt, I am indebted to Freddie for his efforts in pushing through the criticism to reach this pinnacle of success, to offer us so much knowledge, to really paint a picture of the world that's so inspiring and to really influence younger generation people like me coming up who are equally wanting to craft something new and, and broadcast a message to surrender and to retool and to venture forth on rebirth. So I hope you enjoy the episode. Please do consider liking, sharing, subscribing, and all the rest of it so that we can grow our channel. We can keep bringing on members like Freddie Silva of that high caliber to educate us and to sort of show a beacon of light as the, as the future, as we enter, you know, we're still in the dark cavern. And so people like Freddie represent a beacon of light for us. So do help us so that we can continue our work. Until soon, enjoy this episode of the Wisdom Keeper podcast. So greetings, everyone. And I have the absolute privilege and pleasure to be sitting with Freddie Silva, one of the leading experts in the new thesis of an ancient civilization and has done so much work around the world, has an exquisite array of books. He is now working on his seventh book, which has just released Scotland's Hidden Sacred History, along with a number of others, including The Missing Lands and The Lost Art of Resurrection, of which I am particularly interested in as well. We plan to go on a pilgrimage together, a uh, literal pilgrimage. Freddie's just returning from the magic of the portal of Egypt, and I am on my way to India. Both of us have met in connection with a dear fr mutual friend, Helen Tomey, at the Sacred oh. Earth Journeys. And so we want to just thank her for all her unbelievable efforts in making some of these pilgrimages actually really possible. But it's a delight for me to sit with uh, Freddie and pick his brain a little bit about how he got here, what he's putting forth, the timing of all of this right now, astrologically, the significance of the ancient wisdom, and also the application of everything that he's offering right now. So let me start, Freddie, by just thanking you so much for carving out a little bit of time for us today in your schedule. Congratulations on the new book and also the documentary. And I actually, in preparation for this, saw quite a number of your documentaries. So you, you really are a tour guide, you're a researcher, you're a, in a way, you're a mystic because you're tapping some very, very ancient knowledge and uh, a documentary filmmaker. Uh, what got you started on this whole adventure, Freddie? I was drawing pyramids when I was three. That was a sign. <laughs> I got sidetracked. Uh, I mean, I was uh, like things which didn't seem to add up or made sense. Uh, I never, even at a young age, I never really accepted the way the world was taught to us. And it kind of stayed with me until I went through my commercial uh, career, 14 years. And then I decided that just the commercial world just wasn't for me anymore. I was making tons of money and uh, I was finally miserable. So I took a left turn at Albuquerque went off researching crop circles and wrote uh, a best, an international bestseller on the subject, uh, which is, still is, by the way. It's just being re-released uh, this month on its 20th anniversary. So that kind of set the whole bowl rolling. It gave me the confidence to go and do what I really wanted to do and make a living doing it. And I haven't stopped touring in 20 years. So something's going right. It's incredible. You know, those left turns, they make all the difference, don't they? So what age would you have been when you made that departure in Albuquerque, so to speak? What what, what age would have that been in your in your biography? Oh, well, uh, physically it would have been 38. Uh, and uh, But it, it started before that. And, I, and looking back with hindsight, it's kind of interesting that uh, I was, was getting fired for having a conscience. I was working as a creative director in advertising, uh, not far from where you live, actually. And um, I just said, there's moments where you sit at home sort of looking at your navel and thinking, you know, why is it that I, I should be doing better with my life? 
uh, given <laughs> what I preach and uh, the, the, the values for which I stand and why am I getting uh, so castigated for this? And then I just took a leap of faith. I just uh, decided to go off into the uh, fields and uh, start investigating and just having a good time. And, you know, one by one, you have these spiritual experiences and otherworldly experiences, which you cannot explain. You don't even know they're even possible until they happen. And that gives you confidence to believe that there's something else looking after you. And then you have to take that big leap of faith. You know, as uh, uh, Bernie Taupin once wrote, uh, Elton John's lyricist, you know, you, you reach the, the bridge, you have to either cross the bridge or fade away. And I decided mm. to cross the bridge. Uh, I mean, what else is going to happen? You either end up miserable or you at least die trying. Uh, I'd rather die trying. So far, I'm still trying and I'm still quite alive. Yeah, it is a remarkable. It's a remarkable act of courage, right, to follow your intuition into the dark night, not exactly knowing where it's going to take you. But there is there is something. There are angels, in a way, sort of guiding you along. And I imagine once you really oh, yeah. give yourself over to it, you've you've had quite a magical ride. And you know, if you didn't want to hold back right now, like what, when I say the word angels guiding you, what what kind of what do you make of that? Oh, the management, yes. Um, they, have very, <laughs> they have a very strange sense of humor. That's the one thing about it. Uh, no, I, I met the management very early on in my career uh, as a researcher. And uh, it really, again, I, I was not expecting any of this. Uh, I was actually researching crop, crop circles. I was getting very close to understanding how they're put together, who's behind them. And then one day I'm actually levitated inside one of them. I didn't think that that was possible. I got taken out of body and I can still remember seeing these people surrounding me. And uh, later on, only about three years later, I started to uh, put, make the connection that the crop circles and ancient sites are one of the same thing, mm. built originally by the same group of people who are now no longer in physical form. And uh, it was one of my first experiences in the Great Pyramid. I saw the same people coming out of the stones in total darkness, uh, as clearly as I'm seeing you right now. So those two events by themselves just kind of shape you. Uh, because you realize there's something else going on here and i'm being supported i uh, you know my mission was always to you know put this information forward into the public domain so that more people could be aware that there's a bigger picture going on here and mm -hmm. if it happens to me an ordinary person surely it can happen to other people so my risk sort of relationship with the with the management uh, is very <laughs> physical i actually call them real people because to me they're very physical just as we are in our level of reality but in their level of reality they'll be on you know fm 1 million you know we can't even begin to understand where they exist but they portray and they show themselves to us in a way that's in a way that we can understand. And that mm. was one of the things I discovered very early on. They said, this is not how we actually look in our level of reality, but in order for you to be comfortable with who we are and to, for your brain to understand who we are and what we look like, we uh, show ourselves in a way that's comfortable to you. And it's also culturally uh, changeable. So if you're in Ireland or in Persia or in China, mm. they'll show themselves in a slightly different way to accommodate for that cultural thing. So I thought that was a, a, a wonderful way of, of communicating and they're always around. Uh, they're always... I, I, I give them credit for being the foundation for the work that I do because it's like any musician would understand this. You have this inspiration, this idea that comes out of nowhere and you wonder where did that come from? Mm -hmm. And you follow the trail, you trust the process, you don't know where the roadmap is or what the roadmap is taking you, but somehow you end up getting there. Uh, and that's what drives me with these people. So it's a very personal relationship. And I think everyone has this relationship if you just care to, to follow it. Now, Freddie, do you do you do you do you have any sense that they're? Um, I mean, what would you say to your critics who say this is sort of an archetypal or unconscious manifestation? That these are archetypes in a sort of Jungian way, versus the fact that there may be external agencies. How do you how do you how do you uh, how do you respond? Oh, I think it's external. Yeah. Uh, I think that there's an oversoul as well that uh, surrounds you. I mean, you're just a, a vessel, uh, and your soul is basically housed in this vessel. So that's the first layer. Uh, so you can always say it's an archetype which your soul is trying to use as a way to give your brain an idea of understanding what it is that you're receiving from another level of consciousness. Uh, that is very much true. And it's kind of goes around the Jungian model to a certain degree. Uh, in my experience, there's, there's, there's another experience, and that is that there's another level in which there's a lot of sentient beings that exist and they are more than happy to help you because, mm. and I quote, uh, we know how difficult it is to uh, choose to incarnate in a physical world where you are limited. 
by your physicality. And the paradox is that you spend all your life reading books, watching videos, going to lectures and going to sacred sites to understand the nature of who you really are. Mm. So it's, it's a bit of a, a, a cosmic joke. Uh, mm. uh, as Dante once wrote, you know, it's this wonderful uh, device where you try to be part of this divine comedy. So for me, it's uh, and for many people that I've encountered on my journey, these people are very, very real. Uh, they ex ex uh, inhabit another level of reality, which is parallel to ours. And they're more than happy to assist if we just ask them. But they're not going to provide the answers. That would be easy. Mm -hmm. uh, they're just going to give you the uh, the goalposts, and you have to kick that ball for the goalposts yourself. Otherwise, yes. there would be no purpose for you to be incarnated in the first place. Yeah, in, in the tradition that I come from, Tibetan Buddhism, there certainly is this idea that there are external agencies, and, and not all of them are actually, you know, all that, you know, uh, ben, ben, beneficent. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to be careful, in other words, with these agencies. Have you ever, you know, how did you work in your initial contact with the management? How did you work with any fear that may have came up? And, and then how do you discern who you're dealing with? And do you have any stories where it didn't go so well? <laughs> no, it's always gone very well. And I mm. think it's a matter of trust uh, and gut feeling. I always feel very uh, supported. It's like a family that I want to hang out with during Christmas and I never want to go home. You know, it's uh, it's that kind of feel because my intent was always for the search for truth and also for personal development. That's always been the, the clear aim. And I think once you set that aim, whether consciously or subconsciously, you attract the kind of entities that will help you further that aim. Now, if you come from a very negative stance or you happen to believe uh, in uh, negative alien deities like greys who from what I read, are not particularly nice people. Uh, mm. They're very confused entities, and they like to experiment on people and animals because they have no idea where emotion comes from. That's their biggest uh, problem. They're trying to understand how humans and animals function. Uh, so if you go in with that kind of uh, idea and that kind of desire, then you will connect with that kind of entity. Mm. But from my personal experience, it's always been very positive, very guiding. It hasn't always been um, simple because otherwise it would be too easy to get on with life. Uh, you have to do the work yourself. They mm. do just give you stepping stones. You have to actually follow that path and step on the stones yourself. And sometimes you slip and fall off and you get back on again. You know, the trick is not to make a habit of falling off the stones and keep going. But I've always felt very guided uh, in my uh, work because, and again, seven books and 13 documentaries later, and they keep expanding. Yes. I look back on the body of work and I see how much of it has actually helped people in a very positive way. And that really comes from working with the people uh, that I, again, that I call the management who are essentially feeding me a little bit of information that then I have to do the research to complete the dots. So I felt nothing but uh, good vibes coming out of this. And I think it, it, it really comes down to your gut feeling that uh, you, you, you just have to learn to trust. Mm. And you kind of use that gut to say, I feel good about this or something about this doesn't quite add up and it smells and you walk away. You know, uh, I, it really come, it's a very simple process for me. So wonderful. I mean, it seems, seems like the word that's coming up for me is a, a, a trust and alignment. I mean, yeah. if, if, you, if you have a good integrity and a good motivation, then, then like meets like. And so you get guided in this way. And, you know, the proof is in the pudding, as you, as you say, a very large body of work. If I could ask you to summarize to date, you know, in, in, for, for, per, for people who might not be as familiar, how, how would you summarize the body of work, what it is that you have try to encapsulate in all your documentaries and in your writing, uh, and even in your pilgrimage leading, I mean, because you're trying to then enter a smaller group into an experience. But yeah, yeah. in your own words, how would you sort of encapsulate to this to date what, what your body of work really represents? I think it represents an ancient system of knowledge. That's, uh, that's what it essentially comes down to. Uh, there's nothing really new that I'm doing, uh, like so many people uh, of my kind who are trying to achieve the same purpose. And that is to bring enlightenment to people who are looking for that enlightenment and we're actually living the enlightenment and then showing how others can follow in that path. Uh, so it's part of a very, very long tradition of people who've done exactly the same thing, uh, going back to Plato or uh, even Alexander the Great, um, the invisible brotherhood in the Middle Ages, the Rosicrucians, we're all part of this long mm -hmm. lineage of people who are trying to do the same thing. And just like the Tibetan mystics as well. Uh, they, I was, in fact, I'm just reading a book on Tibetan mysticism right now, uh, uh, coincidentally enough, and I'm watching the parallels to what I do in my own work. So I'm just using the same method, using different words. 
but it really comes down to at the end uh it's about self-empowerment uh so if i use myself as the blueprint uh i've watched myself grow over 20 years of my work from what i used to be to what i am now and it's through my experience and my own research and the body of work that i've created that i become the person who that i am and then i can become an example to others i'm not trying to convince anyone to do anything i'm just sharing these are the facts this is what's happened. Now you choose how you want to go ahead with this information. I'm not here to convince you of anything. And I think that's the best thing you can do. You know, it's a bit like Gandhi said, you just be the change you wish to see and just mm. let things fall where they may. So that's really what it comes down to. It's about the idea that you are becoming self-empowered through experience and also through very uh, verifiable information. And the you know the thing that I I see in your work and may, maybe there may be just two or three others that come to mind sort of pioneering this this uh, assertion that the civilization story or narrative that we are compelled by in sort of modern day and mainstream is is but a half truth and that the story is much longer and you know the sort of narrative that you know somewhere in the fertile crescent around you know, the period where there's a transition between uh, hunter-gatherers and the uh, rising of city-state, there is this sort of explosion in high culture that happens that we're so, so sort of just take for granted. And, you know, your, your assertion is that, that that is just one chapter and it has been preceded by many, many other, you know, chapters. And, and yeah. I'd like for you to just comment on that. Because I think therein will will develop a little bit of a, a of a new narrative that will then position your new book. Because I see your book as just another, you know, you know, bit of bread in the breadcrumb trail. Like I, I sort of feel like with each book, you are you know also sort of combining a kind of meta narrative of a of a lost civilization, and more particularly than a lost civilization, a coherent science about the soul that then gets expressed in, in, in what seems like disparate cultures, which I find so fascinating, this sort of universal spiritual technology, high art of the uh, soul's resurrection uh, that is kind of lost in time. But if, if you have a third eye and you're being guided by the management, maybe you can start to connect dots. I see your work as a vast collection of dots creating a new picture of our history. So please lead us on a little taste of that. <laughs> and it wasn't even planned, by the way, uh, which is very unusual for a writer. I usually plan these things out, uh, you know, meticulously, and none of it's planned. It just seems to come out in a very coherent way, which is what I like about it. Uh, because a, I can't make it up as I go along. I'm literally being led by the information as I find it. And the more important thing is to ask the local people about their perceptions. So most of our history, especially in the Western world, comes from a European background. Uh, especially in the Victorian era, it's been shaped by that uh, by that assumption, and a lot of it has also been backed by the Catholic Church. So there is a bit of a, a constraint around the thinking, which gets us to the 21st century, and now we're realizing the picture really is a half truth. Um, and a lot of it is very political, uh, politically controlled as well. Mm -hmm. So when I was researching the material for the missing lands, I wanted to ask the question. What is it about all of these stories from indigenous people around the world that they talk about a parallel civilization when they were hunter-gatherers, living in caves, you know, without clothes, um, you know, eating animals, eating each other. And suddenly you have these stories from New Zealand to South America to China, Japan, Mesopotamia, all around the world, talking about a parallel group of people who were exceptionally tall. They were very light-skinned. They were blonde, blue-eyed, red-haired, and green-eyed which drives a lot of woke people crazy, by the way. Uh, I, get, I get accused sure. of being a racist. Racist, but, yes. I mean, yeah, your, your, really your critics. Yeah, what do you say to your critics who say that that's a white narrative? Well, I just uh, I, I just point out that I'm not quoting this from my point of view. I'm quoting the indigenous people mm -hmm. around the world. So when the people in Polynesia who are dark-skinned and look very different to myself, when they start addressing this and they're saying, no, we're not talking about Europeans. We're talking about a race of people that were here long before Europeans showed up, like 10,000 years before Europeans showed up. 
And we were very comfortable with them. It wasn't a colonizing thing. It was an exchange of information. And these are the people that gave us the moral code, that gave us the, the accoutrements of civilization. And the, um, uh, uh, the phrase that they used is, they were human-like, but not quite human. Mm. And I hear that a lot. So again, it's uh, turning the whole thing on its head that we shouldn't be looking at this information from a current political or um, political correct point of view. Uh, we're looking at this from an age-old structure that comes from indigenous people. We let them talk uh, their story because we never get to hear about it. And that's what makes this story so interesting. The fact that I'm in New Zealand listening to uh, words that are of Armenian origin mm. from where a group of such gods originally came from, who then are found in South America by a different name, who are then found in Easter Island by a different name, who then are found in Japan in Central America. And that's how we began to piece together the whole story that we are living here with a group of people who ran a parallel civilization that was already on the wane 12,000 years ago when the Ice Age struck and it finished most of them off, along with most of, of uh, the hunter gatherers too. And when I was reading a lot of the uh, stories around the Pacific, which I still think is one of the oldest places on Earth, that bit where there's hardly any land, all the stories that seem to come from the Pacific Rim or the islands that survived the sunken continents, according to the local traditions, those are some of the oldest traditions I've ever read. Uh, Mesopotamia mm. almost is like a something that's brand new. They don't even care about Mesopotamia. They keep talking about the Pacific Rim and how everybody got around in uh, in ships and as easily as you and I go shopping for a can of baked beans at a supermarket. So looking at all of these stories, it was able to, I was able to put together this coherent uh, dialogue that really talks about a group of people who really uh, were masters of nature. They knew how nature works, could bend it at will. And then, and sometimes they didn't get it right either. I mean, they were, they did have sort of uh, arriving civilry as well. Uh, there were these moments where the gods were attacking each other. So they fell for the same problems that we have here. But on the whole, most indigenous people were very comfortable with them. They were very accepting and they look up to them as being an example of how to live a very good life. And that's what helped us sort of string this whole story together. Yeah. So what are we, what are we going to call these people? What, you know, they go by different names. Give, give us a few of, 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 the, of the local uh, um, terminologies across culture uh, for the name uh, of this civilization, we want to call it. Oh, I wouldn't even call it a civilization. I think they were just a group of uh, a, like a sisterhood and a brotherhood. They were, they were connected by about eight islands. They lived on island nations. They were very adamant about, about staying away from human beings. And I suspect that they knew that they had something that hunter-gatherers didn't, and they didn't want to interfere with the natural development of another culture. Uh, just like we would show up in, you know, in uh, New Guinea, in the mountains of New Guinea, and we interact with a culture that's still walking around without clothing, and they have no hierarchy. And at that moment, we've interacted and we've distorted their natural direction. I think they were very careful for that. Uh, so in South America, it was Viracocha and his Hai Hai Wapanti. Uh, there'll be a test on this, by the way. Uh, and it, mean, it literally means, in Aymara, it means the Shining Ones, which, of course, are the sa is the same uh, acronym that was given to the um, followers of Horus in Egypt, who also arrived in Egypt in 10,500 BC. There was an agricultural revolution along the Nile, and they were called the uh, uh, F Shining Ones, followers of Horus which is then the same nickname as the Anunnaki, the people of Anu who lived in the Armenian highlands, who always get very negative press. And I don't know why or who started it, but it, the story is completely different to what you get to hear, especially on ancient aliens. Uh, mm -hmm. And then you have the, uh, the other name that they were given was the people of the serpent, which I find all the way through India, the Naga people, for example, mm -hmm. uh, which goes through Tibet, Nepal, and also China, Tibet, yeah. dragon uh, lineage. The mm -hmm. Japanese divine kings, which are also part of the Naga um, civilization, they appear in Central America as the people of the serpent, uh, uh, called the um, uh, Nakul, and also, now I'm going through all these dead languages in my head, <laughs> the Kanul. And then they appear in Portugal, uh, ironically, at the very foot of the mountain where I was born, which is very weird, called the uh, Ophusa, the people of the serpent. And I always wondered, what's this about? Well, it turns out that the people of the serpent was the nickname given to anyone who had control over the laws of nature, which by and large are electromagnetic. So essentially you're giving uh, face to two forces which are invisible, electricity and magnetism, which always flow in serpent form. So if you are a person of the serpent, it means that you have learned to control these forces 
and you can apply and bend them at will. And this, of course, is reflected in the uh, mythologies. So these are just some of the names uh, that were given to them. There were also the Urukeu of Easter Island and New Zealand. Mm. Um, and that's just a tip uh, on, on top of my head. There's a whole bunch more. But essentially, when you figure out what the names mean in the local language, they are one of the same thing. They're either the red-haired people, shining ones, or people of the serpent. Wonderful. That's, well, that's, a, that's a great encapsulation. And, and then sort of bring us back to the uh, timeline now sort of the uh, the current narrative versus the narrative you're proposing. How far back are we are we imagining? The one that survives uh, in bits and pieces around the world is just before the end of the Ice Age. So we're talking about 10,800 BC when we uh, the Earth is hit by some something very large. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and there's stories from China all the way to Central America where the Earth stopped rotating. And at one point, it began to rotate backwards. And this is picked up in... Uh, India and also in Egypt. So these are some of the oldest things which can now be validated by astronomy. Uh, and also we have the exact impact points of incoming meteorites, especially off the coast of America. We have the, what we call the Carolina Bays. <coughs> Sorry, a bit dry in here today. The Carolina Bays, which are these uh, massive uh, meteorite strike points from North Carolina all the way to Florida. And you can still see them from an airplane today. There's thousands of holes uh, which look like little eye shapes, which shows that, that the direction of incoming projectiles from the northwest of the American continent. Now, this sets off the, uh, the Younger Dryas, and it's at this point that we start picking up all the mythologies, and uh, this leads us, of course, to the Great Flood of 9700 BC, which is when the Ice Age collapses, again due to what they call burning mountains coming from the sky. So mm. these poor people, they only didn't just go through one cataclysm, they had to survive another cataclysm within about 900 years, so within a, a few generations. So they were already preparing for the next cataclysm and they were setting up outposts all across the earth, which is why these stories survive. Amazing. And so what, what, <clears throat> what kind of major critique are your critics ledging against you in terms of this particular narrative what's the what's the single most you know challenge that you face and that you've had to navigate against this sort of perspective i don't that's the funny thing uh, they'll start <laughs> doing they'll, they'll start doing personal attacks which is a good sign that you've already won the argument and they'll, 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 there's no evidence it's all mythology yeah but mythology are eyewitness accounts they're just written in a way that make, to us, they look like fairy tales because the language that was around 10,000 years ago is very different to our language. Mm -hmm. uh, just as you're trying to explain something, uh, a story in Persia to someone in France, you don't quite get it the first time. You've got to look at the metaphor and the symbol before you understand, oh, of course, this makes perfect sense. So a lot of the, uh, uh, the information really uh, the attack comes from the uh, archaeologists because they, they, they're, they're like their vendettas. Uh, they, you should see what they do to each other, let alone what they do to people who are not part of their club. And right. this is an established fact. If they just spend some more, some more of their time researching uh, and integrating other people's work, they'd actually get along further than, like we are. For example, I mean, I ask archaeologists, I ask historians, I ask geologists, astronomers, astrologers, psychics. I bring in every single facet of information so that on my desk, I can look at all of this and go, wait a minute, that gives us a better mm -hmm. foundation from which to stitch this story together. And when you stitch the bits together, they all overlap. That's the strange thing. Mm -hmm. So from, when you're looking at it from one specific point of view, let's say archaeology, they're very much focused on pottery shards. They love their pottery shards. And unless you have pottery shards, you have no civilization, let alone that, you know, if you and I were sitting here right now, I dropped the pot accidentally, moved on. That pot was covered by debris for thousands of years. They were able to figure out the entire civilization for the fact that I dropped the pot on this particular land thousands of years ago. You can't do that. I mean, that's just such a myopic way of looking at the world. And what I love about this work is that nobody has the answer. Lots of people had bits of the answer, but only by sitting back and looking at all of how all of these things intertwine, mm. you do begin to see that there's an overlap. Uh, for mm. example, uh, Robert Schock, who's a good friend of mine, a great um, a geologist, uh, he was looking into the uh, near Earth scenarios of uh, end of day destructions, and he wrote a lovely book on it. 
There's been 13 near end of civilization scenarios since the uh, Great Flood. So this is a recurring theme. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you sort of sort of put his information on top of the astronomical data, you begin to realize that there is a relationship. And when you look over the geology and then mythology, you begin to realize all of these things are providing a very good snapshot of any point in time. So it's very important to maintain a very open mind and mm -hmm. see what everybody else is saying and what they're bringing to the table. And that's what keeps the critics away. Mm. Talk to us about Gobekli Tepe as a as a as a as a, as, a, as, a, as an evidence of this uh, prior timeline, extending the timeline. Well, that's Gobekli Tepe is very interesting because we'll never get to the bottom of it in our lifetime. Uh, there are at least uh, uh, sixty five oval stone circles in that hill. The whole hill is artificial. We've only just dug maybe 5% of the whole thing. But structure D is very important with these wonderful pillars, the T-shape uh, pillars with the engravings, uh, the T being the breath of God in every ancient culture. That's what the T-shape means. Now, there are some very interesting uh, carbon-14 dates there because when you look at the wall that's been built inside the actual structure, you realize that the wall has been built after the fact as though it's protecting the original sacred site. Mm. And it was done very carefully. And the first time I looked at this, I thought, someone has built this to protect the site as though they are, you know, and then they're infilling the, um, the whole thing with dirt, but very carefully. They didn't just dump trash into it. It was very carefully filled in as though they're protecting it from some major uh, uh, upcoming catastrophe. And they expected to come back and dig up the whole thing later. Well, of course, they didn't. And I uh, stuck my neck out before the third carbon-14 test came out. The first ones came in after the uh, the Great Flood, uh, the, the Younger Dryas. And I said, this isn't right. I bet you if you get go right into the actual debris inside the wall, you're going to find an earlier date for this. And sure enough, we have 10,200 BC, which is very close to the date also given by the mythologies in Egypt about a, pro uh, a vision that was prophesied by one of the pharaohs of these burning mountains coming down and destroying the whole globe. Uh, and the same story, by the way, in Noah, in the biblical Noah uh, flood story, which is based on the Sumerian tradition. So we have that to go on. Now, every monument on the face of the earth commemorates its date of construction by whatever it is looking at the sky. So if you're standing in structure D, you're looking behind you, there's a hill. So you can't quite see what's going on because the stars are obstructed. But if you look at the two main pillars at, towards the north, in the winter solstice of 10,450 BC, you have a perfect match for Vega, the pole star of the period, right in the middle. Now, turn right behind you, you have pillar 51, 52, and 53, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it's a test of memory here. Uh, they offer you a perfect view of an unobstructed horizon. And if you sit there very patiently between these two massive central pillars, like two blinkers, you will see on pillar 51, the first rising of Orion's belt on the spring equinox, of 10,450 BC, you will take 50 years. The uh, next pillar gives you the midheaven position and the third pillar gives you the setting. Now, why is this important? Yes. Because at the very same moment on the Giza Plateau, the pyramids are commemorating the same date and other structures are also commemorating the same date around the world. But the thing that connects all these stories together is the fact that all of these gods that we've been talking about, every one of them without exception around the world, are always associated with Orion and specifically the belt stars of Orion. Uh, even the Maya talk about the, uh, the the center of Orion and especially the M42 nebula that sits just below the belt as being the heart of the universe. It is the place from where everything comes from, all creation, even human beings, mm. which is interesting because NASA has just admitted that M42 is the biggest star forming region in the whole universe that they can figure out. So how do they know this? So Gobekli Tepe essentially is commemorating a dating time. And it gets stranger because the original name, which is Portasar, it's an old Armenian name, literally means the umbilical cord of Osiris. Now, what's Osiris doing in, in, uh, in uh, Southern uh, Turkey. Armenia? Well, all you have to do is go to Egypt, which is uh, and Giza, which is the uh, uh, Giza is essentially the, um, the doorway of Osiris, the plain of Osiris. So one of those moments where I think I'm going to give them credit for this, where the management drops this image into my head of drawing a line between the small pyramid, the corner of the small pyramid 
going to the corner of the big pyramid. And I thought, okay, I can do that. I've got very accurate uh, maps. And you draw a, a chord between the corner of Mankaro's pyramid and the one of Khafre, uh, and uh, sorry, Khufu, and you end up exactly at Gobekli Tepe. There's your umbilical cord of Osiris. The two sides are connected to each other geodetically, but also in terms of myth and also in terms of name. This is fascinating. So I'm just going to help, help help me just build a little bit of narrative, and then we'll 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 shift it to Scotland because that's the most recent uh, area of your research to sort of confirm this underlying meta narrative. So we've got Gobekli Tepe. Just give it a date for me quickly. The earliest carbon-14 dating so far is about 10,250 BC. And it's commemorating um, its, its alignment in the stars as below, so, so below a, um, the Orion's belt at that time. Uh, the first rising of Orion's belt is uh, just before that, 10,450 BC. Okay, 10,400 BC, and then so you had want... 200 years in which to play in, before they realized, oh, uh, because they were great astronomers. They could track what was going on in the sky. This is why these monuments were built with huge rocks to survive until our time, almost as if they're trying to say, you've got to keep track of the sky. You've got to keep track of where the Earth is in space because there is a periodic um, a killing of civilization and humans will perish too, but not all of them. Uh, luck favors the prepared. And we know because we've lived through this. So every monument, when it's constructed, always commemorates a specific date. The tarth part is figuring out what it's looking at. So the local mythology is also connected with the, the people of Orion, which is essentially the uh, people of Anu. And uh, so that gives you a clear reference. And sure enough, those three pillars match the exact rising of the first time over the horizon of that constellation, just as it does in Egypt. And then would you add uh, something in Central America or South, South America? Would there be a Mayan equivalent of something like that? Yeah, Pre-Maya, uh, there was the people called the Its that no one ever talks about. In fact, I'm about to do a documentary on them. I find them fascinating. So we have Quetzalcoatl, we have Kukulkan, and then we have Itzamna. No one ever talks about Itzamna. He's the most important one of them all. But they were all people of the serpents. And I suspect that one of these three may have been the Quetzalcoatl. And by the way, it was a, a title, not a name. There were many Quetzalcoatl, which drives historians crazy. Um, he, the original guy, may have been responsible for the original alignment of the Teotihuacan complex, because that also is an exact mirror uh, for the belt stars of Orion. Again, 10,450 BC on the winter solstice on this particular occasion. Okay, great. So now we have three temple complex in three different locales, all aligned in terms of the astronomy and the astrology. Let's now get into the uh, metaphysic or the spiritual utility of these sites, the ritual use, and in terms of the sort of utility, the, the rite of passage that they may have served in terms of its resurrection or its um, sort of transmutation of the psyche. Talk to us a little bit about the utility of these sacred sites. I know that you're a big proponent of the energies in these uh, particular sites, such as the um, the, the, the tombs in Egypt, they're not sort of ornate and decorated. These are these were these were most likely sites where some sort of rite of passage were undertaken. They were practical utilitarian sites. Um, so give us a little now that we've sort of gone the, the big picture and we've seen some consistency across the planet. We see that there's an ancient civilization carrying, bearing an ancient knowledge. We see the cataclysmic impact of the meteorite and the sea rise level destruction, probably via sea voyaging, a, a great migratory sea voyaging capacity allowed them to uh, spread this knowledge into various aspects of the planet. What is this knowledge and its particular use for individuals? It depends on the site. Uh, some of these have multiple uses. Some have specific uses. The one I've tried to focus on is the ones, like you said, which are quite boring, actually. Like the King's Chamber is a very boring place, but it's the most perfect building you'll ever walk in or the most perfect room you'll ever walk in. One, one day I'd like to go there with you, actually. Freddie. Oh, I was just my, there, be, uh, a week be, ago. <laughs> it would be my pleasure. It is an incredible experience. It's like being in the body of God. It's the uh, the octave uh, by the golden ratio. The height is the golden ratio. The box is a, is a mirror image 
in smaller uh, in scale so you have to whisper in there and you it, it, the whole place just reverberates back so it's a very functional site and anyone that i take to the valley of the kings to show a real tomb you can see the difference that there's a tomb where someone's buried and the other one is a metaphoric tomb where mm -hmm. nobody's ever been buried or ever been found mm -hmm. and uh but it's a, uh, like many places of its kind it's a very interesting way to um uh, they, they, they fulfill a function which goes back to this concept of the lost art of resurrection, as I call it, uh, which is to do with this initiation, which as far as I've traced uh, back, uh, it goes back to uh, Japan in 8000 BC. That's the, that's the earliest mention of this. Uh, it was uh, formed part of the 17 ways of Ise, which is another version of Isis in Japan, which is a very interesting uh, place to find Isis. And there were 17 teachings. Uh, each one of them uh, showed a different uh, uh, portion of yourself and how to master yourself in relationship to your soul, but also to nature and the cosmos in general. Uh, whenever you find this number in terms of temples like the Osirian in Abydos or uh, Kenko in Peru, they all have the same number of rooms, the same number of niches, and they performed exactly the same right. Mm -hmm. And the one thing I've always focused on is, is what were they up to? What were they doing in these places? Because they always had this wonderful local folklore of people leaving uh, this world and appearing three days later. And they're declared mm. risen, reborn, or raised from the dead. Mm. And this precedes the uh, guy that we know quite well in the Western world, Yeshua ben Yosef, otherwise known as Jesus, by thousands of years, uh, to the point where in India, uh, there's a guy called Mithra who is doing exactly the same thing. And the, uh, the whole initiation, as far as I've worked out, in a nutshell, they started off, uh, it, it was a free uh, uh, period of training. Uh, first of all, you'd go into these mystery schools, if you were curious, and they would observe you to make sure that you were a, a responsible character and you had integrity. Uh, because this information, when properly improperly used, could do all kinds of terrible things, not just to people around you, but the world and also to yourself. So they would give you basic truths in the first year. The second year, they will give you deeper truths, uh, what the uh, metaphors actually mean and how they can be applied. And then the third year, oh, this is a good period. This is where you train in order to leave the body, have an induced near-death experience and come back from the other world to tell the tale. Mm. Except you couldn't tell the tale because it was forbidden by law. You had to apply what you learned and never talk about it. That was the big thing. So the final uh, resurrection used to take place on the spring equinox. So the church has got the whole thing backwards. The initiation began on the spring equinox and it ended in December. So it was a nine month gestation period, just like the female womb. Yeah. And you would learn about uh, the tricks to keep your focus while you're crossing into the other world. You, in Egypt, in fact, there was one tomb of, well, tomb that we go into of Tutmosis the third and we're the only group to get access to this by the way i don't know uh, who i paid off or who <laughs> likes me in the valley of the kings my, my group is the only group that goes into this chamber and it has the 473 phrases that you have to remember so that when you left the body okay mm. this is an induced near-death experience it's bloody dangerous mm. uh, you've left the body physically and you're now being distracted by all kinds of discarnate uh, people, things mm. that you've never seen before. And of course, you're confused. You want to make sure you're not afraid. You want to make sure your focus is going across this bridge of forgetfulness. And you want to make sure that the three days you spent on the other side are spent very well, extracting information, collecting information from specific people, and then finding your way back into your body. And then you're taking out very groggily, you meet Venus rising before the spring, uh, before the sunrise, and you're declared raised or risen or uh, risen from the dead. So that was what was going on in a lot of these chambers associated with this particular uh, mythology. It was literally a self-help uh, experience where you come back and recognize that you are <laughs> as a god. You know, these are the self-help. Are we going to call that self-help, Freddie? <laughs> I do, uh, because you know, and that point was We're, people keep. That's basically to. enlightenment. I mean, it's dying before you die in order to be fully awake and alive in your life. I mean, exactly. There, is, there isn't a greater spiritual teaching on the planet. Exactly, and even in Tibet and in India, they still refer to these people as the risen, and everybody else are the corpses. 
the people who just go you know, around there each day texting, watching television all the time, completely unaware that in between birth and death and a painful life, there's nothing mm. else. So yeah. yeah, still going on to this very day in specific parts of the world. And it's amazing. It's reminding me of um, uh, the immor or immortality key by Brian Marescu's new or new book on the uh, Gnostic right. and not and the and the Dionysian uh, and also the uh, mystery schools of Greece, who basically used a psychedelic potion to induce a near death experience in order to reclaim consciousness, in order to expand consciousness, so that there's a greater sense of living while alive. Exactly. Seeing something that cannot be seen. This is the motif, the universal motif of the rite of passage. And so, I mean, this is a fantastic, uh, you know, entry point now into your latest book. So please give us that, with that motif in mind, what you found in Scotland. Oh, lots of yummy things. First of all, no one knows where the megalithic culture from Scotland comes from. I was completely amazed by this. I have to so, say, I have to plug your documentary because it's one thing to read the book, but it's another to have those stunning images of those steles and of those those uh, those monolithic structures of the caves, the temples, um, but also that landscape. I mean, it yeah. just is all inspiring a landscape, but that, was it an 18 mile tunnel from one point to the other, that cave? I out know. of out of which the uh, the the Venus what was it the Venus point at the at the at the rebirth of the cave was aligned. I mean, please just give us a little taste because it's just so juicy. It's amazing, isn't it? And uh, I, and I actually have the scars still to prove that I actually found it physically. Uh, I lost my footing when I finally found the mouth of the cave, slipped on some algae, and got trapped upside down between two boulders with an incoming tide. Uh, I don't know why I'm still alive or how. I think I just learned to control my fear and was able to move my center of gravity eventually and get out of there. But uh, it was, uh, I traced the story back to a Rosicrucian who I believe was one of the early uh, Scottish Rite Masons in Scotland. And uh, he was talking about this ceremonial cave and it was supposed to go in, you know, into the belly of the earth mother, like an umbilical cord. Then you come out the other side completely risen. I thought, wow that means you'd have to go and cross the whole of the isle of mull for 18.6 miles and i mean exactly 18.6 miles which just happens to be the numerical value of the lunar cycle which of course all the temples dedicated to this um, uh, initiation are governed by a lunar goddess and i thought what are the chances of picking of all the caves in the whole of scotland and it may be part of a lava tube which may have been adapted by human beings uh, of all the, uh, all the chances they pick one that actually did the specific uh, trail numerically. That's incredible. And then you have to align it to the equinox sunset. That's your beginning. So you're at the bottom of this cliff, which is about 1,500 feet vertically above you, second oldest rock on earth. And there's this tiny cave entrance. When you walk in, it's like St. Paul's Cathedral. It's a big dome on the inside. And you can still follow the trail for about 200 feet. Now, because the sea level has risen since the time this was used, um, the sand keeps getting trapped further and further back into the cave, which means you, it's now blocked at the rear. But when I'm reading the original text from the 17th century, uh, this guy called McKinnon actually describes features which are now no longer seen in the cave. So it's quite clear he was you know, only 300 years ago able to progress a considerable distance away. The other part of the story was finding out, well, I can't get, I've got the entrance, I've got the uh, part of the neck. The only other way to prove this story would be to find the exit. And of course, it goes exactly uh, on the same level as the equinox marker. Oh and I mean, gosh. exactly. So there's a two degree variation at that latitude, which is perfect. And there is a cave on the other side of Mal called the Cave of the Young Maiden. And there's no story about a dead woman or a woman who lived there or anything. And I'm thinking- right. Well, of course, the maiden refers to the maiden that you marry, that the initiate marries when they have achieved that connection to the other world, because yeah. she represents the divine mother that represents the whole wisdom in the universe. And she can only be married in a dark recess. That's why you have the image of the Black Madonna in Europe. She is same, in, same in the Tibetan tradition, that's Prajna Paramita, exactly. the wisdom goddess is voidness. She is the emptiness of of reality she's the openness of reality out of which everything is born exactly you marry this divine bride it's a story of the arthurian uh, grail quest as well 
uh, rewritten for a different era in the Middle Ages. So yeah, there you are. The cave of the, the uh, young maiden is the exit to the, this incredible tunnel. So Scotland is full of these incredible stories, but they seem to go back to uh, a very old tradition of people who I was able to trace uh, to uh, the Armenian highlands. And there's a lot of Armenian language in Old Gaelic, which is why this uh, book would become so fascinating. I would never have put those two things together. So we have stone circles in Scotland, especially in Orkney, which has the most beautiful stone circles of all, uh, named uh, uh, name by uh, an Armenian uh, group of people. And they tell you exactly what the stone circle is doing. So mm -hmm. the ring of Brodgar, the ring of Stenes, uh, Bukan, all of these places, even the, um, the stone circle of Kalanish, which means the, the stone cross on a ridge in Armenian, which is exactly what it is. Um, all of these things led me to the, the stories about this group of people in Ireland, which back then, Scotland and Ireland didn't exist. They were just geological entities when they, the two were almost inseparable. And there was a group of people called the Tuatha de Danann that used to be the mythical race of giant people that uh, came there. Very tall, light skin, blonde, blue eyed. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. We've heard that I somewhere before. Trail back to Ukraine, uh, ironically, Bulgaria and Romania. They were called the Tuatha de Danu back then. And they were part of a divine bloodline that had originally come around the Black Sea. And they originated as the Anunnaki of Armenia. And there you'll find the original stone circle, which is um, uh, Karahunj, which looks exactly like the original uh, lost brother of Kalanish on the Isle of Lewis. So the two are literally sisters of each other, separated by a huge track of time. So and the, the thing that really blew my mind was that the civilization didn't go from France up through the south of Britain towards northern Scotland. It went around Britain, started in Orkney, and then it went south to Lewis and south to Ireland, where another group of people met up with them who came from Sardinia, Malta, and originally from Armenia, also mm. the same people. So there are two groups of migrating magician priests that brought the um, sacred uh, knowledge to Ireland and Scotland. I did not see that one coming. Wow. Wow. What, what kind of confirmation is it at that point for you personally? Let's leave aside the metaphysic, the... Uh the astronomical, what is it like for you, Freddie, when you're on these adventures? You've followed the breadcrumb trail. You have a large body of knowledge behind you. You have your spiritual guides above you. Uh, but even you, at every step of the pilgrimage, are walking into the unknown. You don't know where that cavern is going to lead. You don't know where the breadcrumb trail is going to lead. What's it like, Freddie? Just give us a little you know, personal little uh, insight. It's a bit like walking around like a child. Uh, I mean, really, I don't expect anything. Uh, I think people go to these places expecting something and they will be disappointed because it won't happen when you're expecting something. These things happen when you're not expecting anything. You just accept that something's going on, which is greater than yourself. And it's always that sense of wonder. I walk into these landscapes, I take my notebook and I'm observing, making notes, and I'm hearing uh, stuff going in the back of my head. Suddenly I get flashes of inspiration. I draw things down. And the whole picture just suddenly appears. Uh, it, it is a magical experience being totally integrated into the landscape and following in the footsteps of people who literally were described as magician priests. Mm -hmm. So, but that's just my experience because that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for these uh, validations that will help me to show others that yes, there is a body of knowledge that you can draw from that will make you better than you are right now. It, it's an expansion of your own consciousness. And if I can do it, you can do it too. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm no one special, particularly. I'm just like anybody else. I'm just looking for, for my particular journey. But the beauty of it is that you're going there with a blank slate and slowly the slate gets filled with all of these little breadcrumbs. And then you have to go to libraries and research it and put some science behind it so that the skeptics can be brought to the middle ground. Because it's easy to talk to people like you and I. The hard part is to convince people or well, at least get them, uh, people who are skeptical to see that there's a different uh, version of events going on here. And if I can do that, I've done my job properly. Yeah, and you've done it so well and so beautifully and in so many across mixed media, which I think is very helpful. Honestly, the photographs are stunning. Well, the, film, the film documentaries add a whole nother dimension. Uh, your eloquence as a lecturer is, is stunning. Uh, and so you have a very rich way of articulating a central thrusting message, which I think has very deep implications and impact. Let me then now bring us full circle uh, through the conversation, given the time is short. And um, 
we are now amidst a metaphorical n sort of go global near-death experience given the pandemic and now given the war that's raging, which has implications with the supply chain of food across the planet. We are, I would suggest, a very potent astrological time of reboot. And I wonder if you have any, you know, sort of broad um, recommendations, suggestions, if there's a particular, what I've often done on the podcast with people who represent various traditions is invite them to share with us some of the mythology that may be relevant to the time, mm. where we are right now. You know, from an astrological perspective, we are in some sea change between the Piscean and the Aquarian. I think I wrote you once and asked you what was going on with the ceiling in there at Dendera and what kind of astrological significance it might teach us. Are there any kinds of mythology um, that might be really relevant to prime us or prepare us or allow us to see the symptoms of COVID, of the pandemic, of the great sea change that's happening around us, just to alert us and to open up that third eye? Oh, I think these things have been around forever. I mean, I was just reading a book to uplift me called 1665, uh, and uh, it talks about the worst year in living memory in Britain, specifically London. Not only did they have bubonic plague, which wiped off a third of the population, once they were, got up from uh, their uh, hovels, they realized, wow, that was close. Then the city burnt down. Uh, so they had, a, they had it worse than us. We've had worse, worse catastrophes on Earth, but they're getting closer and closer and closer. And I think if you look at people like the, the Maya, who also predicted this era as being a great portion of change, which is kind of uh, all on the back of the Indian predictions as well, uh, as in India, not Native America, uh, although the Native Americans also have a very similar explanation, but the Maya are very clear on this. Uh, we're in between uh, two worlds. Uh, we've, we've run out of this last world, which we've explored to its nth degree. We realize what can be worked and what doesn't. And now we're beginning to fall apart because we need to move on to a new experience because life is about an experience. We've completed the experience, and now we have to get, get onto a new experience. And everyone panicked about 2012, and the Maya just laughed at this. They said, mm. no, it's not the end of the world. It's like watching a Volkswagen engine reach 99,999. It goes to zero, but the car still works. It still keeps going. And they said, there's actually a window that's going on here. There's a 60-year window, 30 years either side. And if you, if you reach a critical mass in consciousness on planet Earth, which does not mean 51%, by the way, it's a lot less than that. And we're pretty close to hitting it, by the way. Um, the critical, uh, once you reach a critical mass, you reach that point where things move forward. Now, we've gone past 21, tw uh, 2012, and the window is now closing uh, we, we, uh, to 2042. And the point is that if we don't do it by ourselves, nature is going to basically demonstrate that change is upon us and the changes are going to be much more cyclical, much more connected, and they're going to be much more destructive. And there's no, I mean, nowhere where you go in the world, even in Northern Scotland, even New Zealand, where I go to quite regularly, you see climate change really at work at the extremities. So we are being forced to look at ourselves and how we work with culture, with civilization, with systems of uh, everyday function, which are all falling apart because, well, they're unsustainable. That's why. Mm -hmm. And any physicist listening to this will understand because they know there's two things that happen in the universe. There's order and there's chaos. And it's, uh, as soon as you reach a state of order, it already starts to defunction into chaos. And once you reach total chaos, it starts rising to a new level of order. That's the wave of the universe. But the more systems in collapse you find the greater the potential jump to a new level of order and that's why i find this moment not just frightening but also potentially incredible because mm. if we think that the world really is in total chaos and it really isn't it's a matter of perception really uh, like in new york for example where you are it would have seemed like the end of the world was two years ago and uh, everybody's moved here to portland maine by the way from new york uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, the culture is going up. Uh, but um, it, it sh uh, it's really showing that we cannot maintain this level of culture forever. Uh, we've done it. We've seen that. We've got the T-shirt. It doesn't work the way we're going. And in order for that system to break down and re uh, reshape itself into a new system, we have to go through more chaos. 
but we don't have to go for it if a greater level of people jumps uh, and wakes up to this sort of new resurrected being and realizes we can do better than this. And I think that's where we are right now. We're questioning and everything. But sometimes when we don't get the plot, nature will force us to re uh, reevaluate what we're doing. Yeah, and I think that's so beautiful, and it's very consistent with the way I've been thinking. Also, as a as a, a these two sort of the synchronicity or the the dis dissolution is also on the heels of a regeneration. So the systems are breaking down, but if you look carefully across the board, whether it be the the economic system that's plummeting right now, fiat currency and, and mass surplus, where inflation, I mean, there's also cryptocurrency and decentralized value and also a, a, a bartering. When I was just in Bali and people were hit by the massive loss of tourist industry and they, they went back to their villages. They know how to do the old school way of sustenance. They know how to farm. They know how to barter. They have this thing system called Banjar, which is local authority, which means they don't outsource their power to big government. They have centralized, like more, more cohesive, smaller group uh, 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 governance, self-governance, all of these are old wisdom emerging in the in the squeeze of the crisis. And it's, it's happening ridiculous. politically. I think it's happening in the medical sector, too. I mean, we've outsourced our, you know, health and healing to big pharma. But in comes the psychedelic movement. And, you know, so if the idea is that we are in the sea change and we have a choice, the choice is to let it engulf us or to wake up. Exactly. Then it also it also assumes that, um, given the fact that we've come full circle after all, you know, sort of the the narrative that you've spent your entire career articulating, it would seem that the mystery schools would also see a resurgence at this time. Yeah, and it began pretty much just before the Second World War, and specifically in Britain, there's a sort of a New Age movement that kind of uh, knew how the connection between us and the other levels of reality works. And it's almost like they sent out a cry for help. They, they could foresee big, big problems coming only four years later uh, with the rise of uh, fascism. And uh, the universe, the management heard this and they sent back information, which is interesting because a lot of my teachers, the people that I idolize, which are most of them are now dead now, uh, they were at the forefront of writing some of this stuff back in the 60s and the 70s. Uh, John Michel, one of my main uh, tutors, uh, he was a genius. He knew everything about numerology, about ancient systems of knowledge. These people paved the way for people like myself. So we're now expanding on, the, on what they built. And we're now coming to a point where this information is really going to be useful at times of great change. And in fact, um, I made this sort of uh, intellectual leap of imagination when I was finishing The Missing Lands about the irony of where we are right now with total climate catastrophe, the total dysfunction of economical systems, where the gods were with the same problem exactly on the half cycle of uh, the, the great year. Yes. And I mean, we literally are in the half cycle since the great flood. Is it 26,000 years or so, the great year, 25 something, 25 right. and change? It's about that, yeah, about <laughs> We're right there, years ago, right yes. on the mark. And uh, they were faced with the same problem. They, they, you know, the total annihilation of the planet, someone has to survive and whoever survives picks up the pieces and we restart civilization. Well, we are now at the same point in time and I'm looking at uh, what NASA releases every week, another um, PR release about another incoming asteroid that we didn't know was there. Another potentially life-threatening piece of rock just went past the earth only two weeks ago. And it was pretty close, uh, size of a big bus. So I'm now realizing, wait a minute, this, this idea, this obsession with the sky that we have and how we can blow up meteorites with atom bombs and things, we have the same obsession that the, uh, the ancient gods had with protecting the planet and making sure that this survived. And I've met with people in NASA and they said, it is ironic that we are now having the same obsession with near earth objects that they had 12,000 years ago. And perhaps this time, we are a little bit wiser to understand how to turn the whole thing upside down and maybe work it to our advantage. Mm -hmm. And this is where people like the transcendental movement comes in and people at uh, Princeton Research Anomalies Department comes in because they were measuring the effect of human consciousness to influence local events. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you remember back in the 70s in Washington uh, and Chicago and I believe Detroit, there was a group of transcendental monks who meditated on lowering the crime rate and the, statistically they actually succeeded. 
right. when they left and they moved away, boom, the crime rate went up again. Same thing happened at Princeton, where they actually monitored the uh, influence of a group of 20 people sitting around a computer that was dishing out a computerized drumbeat, and they were able to alter, using the power of intent, the uh, structure of that drumbeat. Now, what could we do as a consciousness if we suddenly were faced with projectiles coming out of the sky or a great uh, civilization ending catastrophe? I think we now have the answers ironically through technology to show that human uh, intent and the power that we have within us collectively can alter the ship of our reality so we're we're kind of back where we were twelve thousand years ago but now we have the chance to be the gods we've been waiting for all along and i think one of your you know one of the the hallmarks of of your legacy will be that you've revived you've spent your precious human life as they say in the buddhist context you've you've you know, committed and made an offering of reviving some of these mystery schools for this time. I mean, because what what good is it simply as a, a rendering in a book or an inspiration as a documentary if we don't take the next step? And what I like about the universal aspect of all these cultures is that it doesn't mean that you have to, you know, it's not one tradition or the other. If they, if they share a common heritage... Yeah. And it's mystical and it's personal. It's decentralized. And it's not about the Catholic Church. It's about the the purity of the the spiritual transformation, and that can actually happen in a Hindu yoga context, in a tantric Buddhist ceremony. It can happen in the island of Bali. It could happen in New Mexico. It could happen with peyote. It could happen in so many contexts. Once you get past the rigidity and the ownership, uh, and you see the 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 universal personal opportunity. Uh, then then maybe people can intersect in ways that are more local for them and meaningful for them but the but the the grand result of people embarking on this spiritual opportunity means that the collective resonance of the planet can be upgraded and i think that's the real message and for that is. for that uh you know if you have any parting words i just want to thank you for being part of the wisdom keeper podcast because really that is what exactly what you are so thank you so much oh, thank you if all else fails, drink heavily. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got to have a bit of sense of humor about this. It's like uh, the Dalai Lama has 49 phrases about, you know, uh, uh, becoming a better person. And they're all very serious, of course. They're very mystical. But the last one, approach cooking and love with reckless abandon. I thought, <laughs> absolutely. And you've got to have a little bit of a... A little twist with all this. You can't take it too seriously, otherwise you lose yourself. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks, Miles. And an honor. And if you do you have any updates or uh, upcoming activities that you want to plug? Because I think people will want to intersect with your work if you, if you, uh, you know, other than your new book. Uh, where are you going next on your next adventure? I'm trying to get to, to Ireland, Sardinia, and uh, Portugal. I want to build, uh, do a bit more research and set up a couple of tours there as well. Uh, unfortunately, the, uh, the price gouging with the airlines has gone through the roof where even yes. Uh, yes. premium economy is $8,000. So I think I might just sit at home and uh, write a few more documentaries and polish up a few things. Um, I've got the 20th anniversary of Secrets in the Fields, which is being released literally this week. Uh, on crop circles, there's always a huge demand for that book, and it's being uh, people are selling copies at six hundred dollars, which is ridiculous. Uh, and also uh, plugging the Scotland book as well, which I, uh, my, uh, I'm very proud of. It uh, again fills in another as uh, area that uh, we knew so little about, and also about the history of Ireland, which is very interesting. So there's always something going on here, but just go to my website; it's uh, all packed with information. Uh, you, you you'll be there for a week. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you. I'll make sure the links are all below. Freddie, thank you for your time. Thank you for your amazing contribution, you, your good cheer. I hope to have a nice drink with you at some point. And uh, if not and if not a wee drink of some sort at some point, I'd love to be in the heart of that sacred temple, the, the pyramid, uh, and enjoying the vibration and going through a pseudo rite of passage, if not the full-fledged experience. So uh, all best to you. Until next time, thank you so much, Freddie. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Wisdom Keeper podcast. If you've enjoyed this presentation of sacred knowledge, kindly like, subscribe, review, and share 
our podcast and video series on YouTube with your network so that more people can benefit from these teachings and together we can create a brighter future. If you're interested in my online courses, our community membership, and pilgrimages I lead, consider visiting the Contemplative Studies program at gradualpath.com. Until we gather again, all best wishes.